I'm Ryan O'Dowd, and you're listening to Ryan's Audiobooks on the Issues Magazine channel. Today we're continuing with the Psychic Bible, the apocryphal scriptures of Genesis Briar Peorage, and the Third Mind of the Temple of Psychic Youth, Section 118, Changed Priorities Ahead, Part 11. Music, Magic, and Media Mischief, The Gnosis Interview with Genesis Peorage by J. Kinney. Genesis P. Orridge occupies the curious position of being both a household name and virtually unknown at the same time. While he has been prominent in performance art, so-called industrial culture, the tattoo and body modification rites of modern primitives, and the underground rave scene, Genesis, or Jen as he is called, and the groups he collaborated in, Throbbing Gristle and Psychic TV, have remained largely hidden from mainstream culture. From 1972 to 1976, Genesis collaborated with Cozy Fanny Tootie as the performance art group Coombe Transmissions in the UK. Their performances were visceral attacks on powerful taboos, including explorations of pain, sexuality, disgust, and outrage. An Easter performance in Amsterdam late in Coombe's career included, in Jen's own words, his being crucified on a wooden cross, whipped with two bullwhips, covered in human vomit and chicken wings and chicken legs, while I had to hold burning torches. People in the audience could hear the skin burning on my hands. Coombe Transmissions was replaced in 1976 by Throbbing Gristle TG, now a four-person project and one of the trailblazers of industrial music, whose work has been described as a model sheet of experimental sound. As Genesis says in the following interview, TG dealt with issues of power, control, image, and propaganda through an unending series of mind game surprises, seeming contradictions, and a conscious flirtation with paramilitary style. In 1981, TG split in two with Genesis and Alex Ferguson forming Psychic TV, which combined the occult and paramilitary themes that had begun to crop up in TG's work. Genesis soon founded a magical order, the Temple of Psychic Youth, or TOPY, which spread word of its existence through Psychic TV gigs and recordings. Influenced by the early 20th century occult painter Austin Osmond Spare, T.O.P.Y. disseminated information on constructing sigils, magical objects intended to focus psychic energy toward a conscious goal. T.O.P.Y.'s version of sigils entailed adult members writing down a favorite sexual fantasy, anointing the paper with various bodily fluids and hair at the 23rd hour of the 23rd day of the month. Sigils were then mailed off to T.O.P.Y. headquarters, where they were held in strict confidentiality and supposedly served to build a reservoir of psychic energy for T.O.P.Y. members' use. In the late 80s, Genesis and crew became active in the burgeoning rave scene in England, jousting with authorities over holding unlicensed all-night dance parties in unlikely locations. Their notoriety culminated in early 1992, when in the midst of public hysteria over Satanism, 23 Scotland Yard detectives descended upon Genesis Home slash T.O.P.Y. headquarters in Brighton, England, looking for evidence of satanic ritual abuse. Much of Genesis' art and video archives were seized, and the tabloids had a field day. At the time of the rave, however, Genesis and his two children, Carice and Janesse, were, were off into Nepal, organizing soup kitchens and encountering Hindu and Buddhist holy men. Faced with likely public castigation if they return home, Genesis and family continued a nomadic life, ending up in the world's designated parking lot for the eccentric and aberrant Northern California. The following interview was conducted in San Francisco in late March 1994. Despite his reputation as a sordid amalgam of Peter Pan and Captain Hook, Jenison tur turned out to be a good deal more complex and charming, even gentle, than his image had prepared me for. It also became apparent that though his motivations are often mischievous and he has an anarchist instincts for stirring up trouble, Jen is also following a unique path of public self-discovery that is surprisingly idealistic. Few individuals better typify the questions raised by the intersections of popular culture, art, fashion, the occult, and radical politics. J. Kinney. The Temple of Psychic Youth is the first instance I'm aware of where a public figure involved in art and music created a public magical group and made it an integral part of their work. Why did you found T.O.P.Y.? Genesis Briar Peorage. Well... When I started doing public events and provocations and happenings in the 60s, I was already reading books by Crowley, and my grandmother was actually a medium. She used to have a good reputation for what was called ectoplasmic phenomena. When she was in a trance, people would claim to have seen almost corporeal manifestations of relatives or people they didn't know. From then on, I had an interest in inexplicable phenomena. The first time I met a person who was in a magical order was in 1969 in Liverpool. The guy came around to his apartment that I was crashing in, and he was what turned out to be Kenneth Grant's Typhonian OTO. 
He was a total heroin addict. As he was explaining to me all about how he was in the OTO, he was a magician and so on, he was tying off and shooting up in the kitchen. And then he was doing the classic squirting a syringe of blood all over the kitchen walls in somebody else's place. And I thought, if that's what happens when you join a magical order, I don't think I want to do it. That was my first introduction to someone who was prepared to say in public that they were involved in a magical practice. Not long after that, I became involved in performance art. At first it was involved with body movement, but very quickly it went into sexual taboos. The performances went from being street theater to having more and more to do with art galleries because those were places where it was safe to experiment. During that time, I got intensely concerned with ritualizing the event and making it have to do with states of consciousness and the assembly of different objects and symbols and seemed to focus something in my own neurology. And I started to notice other things happening every so often. In Antwerp in 1977, I was speaking in tongues really fast, which has never happened to me before or since. During that particular performance, I drank a whole bottle of whiskey, and I also ate branches of this tree that I found outside, which turned out to be poisonous. And in this trance state, I was actually carving designs with rusty metal into my chest. It wasn't planned. It was more as if I was taken over. And then I started vomiting, of course, which was the combination of the tree bark and the whiskey. And because I have to take steroids all the time, if I can't keep the steroid pills down, then I start going into a coma really quickly. Kinney, why do you take steroids? Genesis. They used to give me steroids for asthma when I was a young boy, and it destroyed half my adrenal glands. Now I have to take them to replace what my glands used to do. So I ended up in the Antwerp hospital, lying in the emergency room with his doctor, and he was saying, I can't find a pulse or a heartbeat. And my then partner, Cozy, was getting all upset and saying, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? I remember I was lying there and thinking and listening, but I'm okay. I was in my own body, but I was aware of this conversation going on, and I was in a suspended state. My brain was functioning normally, but I couldn't speak. I couldn't actually move. A transient kind of zombie state was triggered. That was when I decided that whatever it was I was dealing with in these performance pieces, it was getting so peculiar that I didn't want to do it in a public situation anymore, because there were obviously risks involved. I was getting to the point where sometimes I nearly physically died, and I couldn't put that responsibility on an art gallery or on other people, and I should start doing some research quick to find out what I was really doing. I've been going that way anyway, realizing that I wanted to do it privately, with a lot more rigor and thought than and actually sit down and plan it, fast, concentrate, and work out a schedule. And always have somebody who was just there to guide would be able to call me back out if things started to get strange and also to document what happened. Kidding. Who do you look to as a guide? Genesis. I met a woman called Roberta Graham who was also doing very intense private performance pieces, building strange contraptions that took the body to really deep thresholds of pain that would push people out of their bodies. But she was very methodical and very scientific. She would spend months planning a new machine and experimenting and testing it slowly to find out exactly what it did. So I collaborated with her to some extent. I also began doing a lot more reading and thinking and sifting, going back and recalling a lot of these events. It seemed that certain techniques were utilized all over the planet. Maybe if the technique itself was looked at minus names and incantations, or if the incantations were just a series of sounds and the words were unimportant, maybe I should just try and strip it down and see what was really there. What were the key dynamics that made these things happen, minus all the trappings? It was refining the very simplest elements. One thing was the orgasm, and another was various bodily fluids in certain times and astrological conjunctions, and the repetitions of certain types of deep or high sounds. Not long after that, I began working with various women friends as a priestess figure exploring endurance, both in terms of time and pain, rituals privately in a dedicated space, trying to see what happened, if anything, with essence minus mystification. The basic premise in all my work has always been, if I think about something and it seems to make sense, to project it into the public arena of popular culture, to see whether it survives or not in its own right, to see what happens and what is confirmed and denied, and what creatures creates interesting interactions and conversations. To use popular culture as the alchemical jar to see what happens. Why I have to do that, I don't know. It's just been a drive for so long. Mati Kazaza came over to visit during 1979 and 1981 and stayed for over six months with me. And I told them that I was thinking more in terms of a paramilitary occult order that was secreted within something that seemed enough a part of popular culture for it not to appear to be a threat immediately. And for reasons of mischief and fascination, this turned me on. I liked the idea of the mystery and the mischief both. And of course, Monty always encourages something that looks like it might create some short circuits in the status quo. Monty went back to America, and I just sat down and redesigned the psychic cross on graph paper. I wanted a symbol that seems really familiar, that is almost the same as lots of things, but not quite the same, so that people could find it easy to adopt into their personal mythology. Kitty, 
I was wondering about both the T.O.P.Y. cross and the Throbbing Gristles Thunderbolt logo. The Thunderbolt has a slight flavor of a neo-fascist group, and the T.O.P.Y. cross has a feeling of both as an upside-down cross and a Russian Orthodox cross. So you've chosen symbols that are right on this edge where you people can project nefarious intents on them. It's an interesting device on your part. Genesis. I think that symbols are critically important. And that's why with TG it was the same. I sat down with graph paper and we spent a long time deciding how it was going to look and what the proportions would be. Because in Britain and Spain, red and black are the colors of the anarchists. But red and black are also traditionally seen to be neo-fascist colors. The lightning bolt has the SS connotation, but it also has the idea of short-circuiting control. And if you look at the lightning bolt as a break, it's actually the anarchist circle and flag snapping in two. So it was, as you say, right on the edge. Previously with Throbbing Gristle, we had started wearing camouflage and paramilitary stuff and walking that tightrope between the acceptable and the provocative pretty skillfully most of the time. Because of our sense of humor, we managed to keep it going because people soon began to realize that we were actually commenting and pointing things out, not condoning them. We found that people began coming to the gigs dressed like us. They'd come in army surplus and caps and put TG patches on. We triggered something and observed it and then encouraged it. We thought, let's see what happens if it's not the Bay City Rollers or the new kids on the block. Here we are playing with this dark shadow side, but it's the same pop phenomena, with people wanting to feel like they belong and state their allegiance in terms of popular culture and ideas by how they look. Let's not be afraid of that, and let's not be aloof from it. Let's explore it and push it even more. The response was much more powerful than we expected, so we would play with that and do a lot of talking about that, what we would could do that completely contradicts the expectation. Of course, eventually we did a gig all dressed in white with white light, and everything was beautiful, and everyone else in the audience was in black and camouflage and er grimaces. We smiled all the time. We really enjoyed them. And it gives you all these extra cultural weapons. You could do the simplest, stupidest thing, and it seems really loud and large and potent again. Wearing white suits shouldn't make any difference, and yet it blew the fashion fanatics' minds, and it was recorded in the papers. What's happening at TG? They're all wearing white. They've sold out. What's going on? So that was very much a satirical exploration of what happens in popular culture. And what in this dynamic where people want to gather and feel connected with the band? We were mirroring them back, and they'd mirror us, and we mirror them more, until we had a designer camouflage made in Paris, which was to me the ultimate incongruity to have hand-printed camouflage. That stopped because it had got to where there were no games left. With the best will in the world, or trying to confound it, we'd become a rock band. The one thing we didn't want to be that we despised was the rock band, and we'd become one. We chose to go on stage and be as atonal and confrontational and dismissive as we chose, and the more we were, the more it was okay, because people had worked out that that was what we did, so it was all right, and we'd been called on it, and it was going to be accepted. Before the whole process ended, I was already beginning to put out leaflets from the Psychic Youth headquarters. I was beginning to build the next project into TG, with the TG single Discipline, it said on the back, Marching Music for Psychic Youth. So I'd already gotten the name and the concept of doing it much more aesthetic, considered way, instead of it just being thrashing around because it's fun and pisses off mom and dad and the old teenage rebellion syndrome. What can we do that takes us further than that? It seemed to me that we were in this position where we had to stop and take responsibility for our actions. TG was kind of gratuitous, and that wasn't the idea either. It wasn't meant to become really popular or be gratuitous just because we could get away with it. I had serious intent behind all the mind games and the double bluffs and the satires. I decided to design something that was more about my own serious interests, so that I could go deeper and deeper into it and pull people across, so they might have a different perspective on how to do their lives and consider alternative ways of seeing the universe and the potential of their brain and their body and their ability to have control over themselves. Kinney, did it ever occur to you that you might be opening up a giant hole that the unaware might fall into? Genesis, I was warned about that all the time by the people in the Museum of Magic in England. Through my own interest, I got to know the people at the Atlantic's bookshop. I used to go there regularly and fritter away my money on first editions of Crowley and Austin Spare paintings. And I got to know people who were seriously involved in Wicca and were friends of Alex Sanders. I was doing research and I talked to everybody. I told them I felt there was a room for magic to come back out of its closet and see how much relevance it still had. There was a whole generation of people who hadn't seen the 60s occult revival and weren't necessarily interested in learning things by rope but could get a lot from knowing about the possibilities and then could make choices. Some people did say, oh, you've got to have 20 years training first, and you've got to do this and do that, and people go mad if they don't know all the right formulas. And I said, well, I know what you're saying, but then there's this whole voodoo self-hypnosis syndrome as well, that people go mad because they've convinced themselves that that's what's going to happen if they don't do things the correct way. I personally feel it was a responsible thing to do. I was assuming that there would be people who were prepared to investigate these areas and see what would happen when it was done with other people. A lot of people did the same ritual at the same time with the same basic parameters. 
Kinney. In the Gray Book, the intention stated for TOPY is in terms of moral freedom, spiritual freedom, sexual freedom, and against faith, Genesis, and guilt and fear, Kinney. But at the same time, the components of the sigils were these three different bodily fluids in two different portions of your hair, plus this very intimate sexual fantasy, ritually combining these on this 23rd day of the month at the 23rd hour and sending these off to you. It seems like an enormous act of faith on the part of the person. Genesis. I think more of an enormous act of trust. One of the first posters we did say it, abolish fear, establish trust. My personal theory is that if your intention is clear and non-malevolent, then nothing can be done to harm you with those elements of your body. Once or twice, people challenged me and said, I'm sending you my things. How do I know you're not going to do some curse? And I said, fine, I'll send you some of mine. And I always did. I don't re remember doing anything to harm you, so I don't see why you should do anything to harm me. So have what you want. I wanted to contradict the tradition that those things were innately dangerous for some p other people to have possession of, because I thought that, that was some, something people had hypnotized themselves into being vulnerable to. It's the skill of the person attacking it. It's these things that they have. Those are just tools for visualizing and focusing, as far as I'm concerned. That whole area of thought had become too entrenched and paranoid, and it was based on I can hurt you if I want. Well, I'm sorry. I got bullied at school, and I found it a completely intolerable and despicable activity. I thought it was actually very freeing for people to be told, you can let go of this fear. It doesn't matter. What mattered was that you got from, you, from, from your ritual for you, and afterwards, you don't need this stuff. You don't need to keep it. And some times they said, I really want to keep the one I did this month because I feel really connected with it and it still seems to be working for me. And I said, sure. I hate to set up a new dogma. We said, here's a sketch. If something starts working for you and you adapt to it or get uncomfortable, that's okay. We're not here to tell you what to get. We're just saying, have you tried this? Because we've noticed the certain of these elements have worked for us in really interesting ways that we can't fully explain according to this nonsense reality. We're glad that we get these extra things. At the very least, it's fascinating and makes life better, and maybe it's also useful and significant. And all these sigils that came in while I was running to UPY are still absolutely and utterly safe, and not one's been lost or destroyed. Kitty. Those weren't seized by Scotland Yard? Genesis. No, what's really amazing is that they didn't take any of them. Isn't that odd? We wrote an essay called Magic Defends Itself, and I'd say I rest my case. They went up to my office where all the filing cabinets were, and they were locked and the key was hidden. They crowbarred them open, and they left them all. A T.O.P.Y. friend at the house said they just glazed over. They couldn't look. Their arms did this, flipped through folders, and their eyes did this, looks blankly. They left everything. Kinney. But ostensibly it was because of T.O.P.Y. this raid is occurring. Genesis. Yes, because they were convinced that T.O.P.Y. was the proof that the evil satanic rituals were really taking place. That we were incorporating teenagers from Brazil and killing them in rituals. Keeping women prisoners and forcing them off to have babies and eating the babies and all that stuff. Kinney. Let's back up a bit. For a few years leading up to that raid, you had also been involved in the rave scene, correct? Genesis. Correct. Since about 86. Kinney. So maybe there was a confluence of reasons that they were coming down on you. Genesis. Oh, I think so. We were involved in the anti-Dolphinarium campaign in Brighton, and we were involved in anti-apartheid. We tend to go to Trafalgar Square to, to be anti-apartheid society and give speeches. And we've been involved in squatters' rights, and I've been into gay street theater. So we were involved to at least some extent in supporting radical gay rights and raves, pro-psychedelic, semi-legal gatherings of happy people twisting their minds, propagandizing their own view of life. So if they have a computer that says these are the kinds of groups that we don't like, we appear on each list. Basically, I decided to come out of my own closet and go, look, I've actually been doing all this stuff for several years, using me as a guinea pig. And the bottom line is I feel that my life has been incredibly enhanced and invigorated. And I feel I have to share that. Kenny. What's the underlying cosmology that you work with at this point? Genesis. <laughs> to tell you the truth, I'm reassessing everything again. It seems like I was given an opportunity to sit back and reassess to what extent more traditional methods might still be really valuable for people. And not just dismiss them out of hand for the sake of breaking a few holes in a wall. So I guess each time we reincarnate, it's a little bit more serious and, and a little bit more considered and a, a little bit further along in terms of assimilating and respecting tradition. That's partly, I suppose, the fact that I'm educating myself in public. It's a strange and vulnerable thing to do. Kenny. I was wondering because in the Grey Book, the definition you had of TOPY had to do with developing magical work free of gods and deities. Do you still see the universe as not populated with gods and or goddesses or a god? Genesis. Yeah. 
To be really honest, I'm still pretty much an existentialist, but I don't deny that certain energies and resonances definitely seem to work. Things do get manifested when you focus on them and truly desire and need them to manifest. That happens, and I don't really care why. My suspicion is that it's an innate gift that comes from so far ago and is so primal that it's pointless putting names on it and trying to humanize it. I think it's always an error to, error to humanize phenomena. I think that if you substitute the word time in any spiritual or religious text for the word God, or the name of a God or deity, it makes equal sense. Time is infinite and omnipresent and omniscient, and everything comes from time and returns to time. And physical manifestations are the exception, not the rule. So if you want me to give a name to the greatest power there is, I'd say it's time. Kinney, have you disengaged yourself from T.O.P.Y.? Well, Genesis, well, officially we announced that we disengaged ourselves because it was appropriate in terms of Scotland Yard. And I also had this urge to become nomadic. I'd started getting the sense that a nomadic way of not being fixed in one place was really essential. I wrote some essays on it in England before the raid. So it was again a mixture of which comes first. Was it that my guts were telling me that there was that was going to happen? Or did I somehow just have enough of an inner vision that I knew that this was the next step? I don't know. I know that we made the right moves at the right time, and we weren't there when Scotland Yard raided the T.O.P.Y. house. When I was in Nepal, I was fascinated with the devotion in sadhus and the Agori Babas, especially the Agori Babas. Just the simple statement of the path of no distinction, which is what they follow, made so much sense to me. When I was in Nepal, with both the more Bon Pa oriented Tibetans, who are basically sorcerers, and then the Shiva and the Agori and the Naga, I felt the really deep sensation of wow. All the stuff we were doing based on impulse and instinct and intuition and observation here, it makes sense. We were right. That line of inquiry was right. These techniques are being used as a daily thing over here. We are Mr. and Mrs. Normal. We don't have to explain our practices. We don't have to explain scars and tattoos and piercings because the people here do it too. It's a symbol of devotion and a quest for holiness. And that's wild. I just felt, ah, at least a homeland. I could wander around here naked and everybody would be quite happy about it and just say, oh, Baba, and bless you and leave you to it. And that's something I think we're all moving back towards. I think part of the piercing phenomenon and resurgence of, of an interest in early pagan perceptions is actually a gradual remembering of another way of life, a way of life that's devotional, disciplined, and integrated. That's something that has been missing. That's why I even start to respect people like the Jesuits. Kinney, but a central uh, component of that devotional way of life generally is the conception of something larger than the individual. Genesis, I know, I like devotion for its own sake. And it gets me into strange conflicts with people. I couldn't been a, I haven't been able to align myself with an orthodoxy. Sometimes I wish I could, but I just can't. I start to blaspheme and I start to make jokes all the time or change the sentence around to see if it's more fun reversed. I always have to check and double check things and not feel that I'm subservient to the dogma so much as it's working for me. Kinney, dogmas and orthodoxies and belief systems aside, experientially, amidst all this working with forces or energies, haven't you had some sort of experience that makes you think my sense of self in the body is only a convenient fiction? Genesis, oh yeah, ever since I was young, but I just take that as written. This is just a useful vehicle, transient, mortal, and significant. I've always had a very strong sense of that. It's existentialism. I think I could never have read Jean Paul Sartre when I was a kid because I don't feel the need to feel contact with greater beings. I've had really powerful spiritual experiences at times, mystical experiences and visionary experiences, but none of them make me feel that there's a specific one I should align myself with. These phenomena are fabulous and I'm really fortunate with when I experience them, but I couldn't make it into a way of life because I can't repeat them ad hoc. They just come upon me. One of the most fascinating experiences I had like that was in Nepal. Some friends of ours took us to this tiny village with lepers and incredibly poor people. In this small village square, there was a tree in a shrine where supposedly Shiva had sex with this other deity. And it was padlocked up, and there were hardly any people around it except the lepers and the beggars. And we were wandering around taking photos of some of the statues. All of a sudden, out of my peripheral vision, I saw our friend Sri Lokan, who was a Shiva devotee, waving. And at that moment, I immediately went into the trance state where everything seemed unreal, and I was no longer controlling what was happening. As I saw him waving out of the corner of my eye, I knew I had to go straight to him. I went straight to him without speaking. He was in a village priest who had unlocked the shrine and was waving us in. So we took our shoes off quickly and Tree Lokun's going, hurry up, hurry up. So we went inside and he closed the door. Then the priest anointed us with this talak, paint marks of the deity, and I got this really fast freeze frame of the shrine and the remains of this tree in there strewn with animal intestines and mummified human heads and incredible powerful, very dark-edged materials, pools of blood. We had to throw some money on a plate. 
Around the edges were cast iron creatures with heads that come off, and they were all filled with blood, too. And it was really dark, and he started chanting. As soon as he started chanting, it was like Terrence McKenna describes DMT. I just went, woo, instantly into this completely altered vortex. There was a sense of shooting like a particle accelerator and becoming a particle and no longer being in a body, shooting into this deeper and deeper blackness, until suddenly there was a sense of floating in this liquid blackness. The only way we have to describe it in our language was the ultimate blackness, black beyond black. And then... I became really aware that somewhere within this ultimate black were these two shiny, slightly pointed, almost insectoid eyes. I couldn't see them. I just knew that they were somewhere, and distance it'd be light years or feet. And I know that those two insectoid eyes were what was referred to as Shiva, and that Shiva watched. That's what Shiva did. From such a power place of darkness, that's all that Shiva had to do. Just be in that place and have eyes to observe. That was enough. And that was about as powerful as it got, mate. I wasn't afraid, and it was just totally mind-boggling. And all of a sudden it was like, woo, and a real science fiction sound effect. And suddenly there we were again in the shrine. Wow, that was really strange. And Sri Lokan was going, quick, quick. We had to get outside again. All the villagers had found out that we were in there, and they were going nutty because nobody outside their sect was allowed in, and certainly never Europeans. To this day, I have no idea why the priest chose to unlock that place. And when he left, the villagers were still screaming and swearing at him and shouting at us. It's blasphemy. You shouldn't have let that happen. Why were you thinking of? From then on, I gathered he was equally puzzled as to why he did it. That was a really deep religious experience, and it was unexpected. I hadn't visualized something like that at all. I hadn't read it up in advance. It wasn't coming from anywhere I knew of in me. I don't know how long it lasted. I was probably only three or four minutes, the whole thing. But I came away with an amazing respect for the Shiva tradition and those sadhus. And then I went back and talked with Agari Baba and asked me to do my solid gold psychic cross, which I had on a leather thong, so I obviously couldn't refuse. So I gave him my psychic cross, and he gave me his ring and bracelet. So he, we, he gave both of the children gifts off his altar, and he gave us ash from his fire, which burns in his chamber. They, gave, they have records saying that this fire has not been extinguished for over a thousand years, and he told us to bring it to America. We didn't know we were coming here then. Kenny. The Agori Baba is from Hinduism, then. Genesis. They are reputed to be only nine practicing Agori Babas. It's an offshoot of the Shiva Sadhus and the Naths. There are the Nagas, who are pretty extreme and the most revered. He stayed in the chamber most of the time, but primarily they live in graveyards because they have to copulate with dead bodies. Also, some of their initiations are in the jungles with the tigers. They have to sit naked in the place known to be frequented by the most ferocious tigers for days and days, and people bring them the minimum amount of food and water, and they just sit there until they have no fear of any kind of tigers or of death. The Agori Baba's basic discipline is one of the most ascetic. They would have their followers bring them the absolutely most expensive and exquisite feast of chicken and food, and then they would have to eat human shit or flesh off of one of the bodies burning outside. His chamber actually has the gnat in front of the door, so the entire time you have the smell of burning human flesh in there as well as incense. The point is that they're the same. They taste the same to the Yagori Baba. Everything is the same. There is no judgment. There is no moral standpoint or perspective in terms of the implicit nature of things. That's not saying behavior, because obviously there's a morality of behavior. But in terms of the implicit nature of things, they're all the same. Kenny. I was wondering also about your interaction with pop culture and music. You successfully avoided being too caught up in the corporate control of culture, but at the same time, Throbbing Gristle or Psychic TV were cult figures, and a lot of the things you were in the forefront of exploring, piercing or tattoos or industrial music, have ended up becoming popularized, and that becomes a trap in itself. Genesis. Sometimes things do get diluted and homogenized for a period of time. My personal feeling is that oil rises to the top, and if you cast your net wide enough, you'll pull in a higher ratio of serious fanatics. It's something I was discussing with William Burroughs back in 1971. He said he preferred to be the quiet, reclusive, seminal thinker. He liked to wear suits and appear superficially to fit in with the status quo, whereas I like to be the bull in a china shop. It's just a different strategy. Kinney. I wonder if there's a certain danger. It's the same with energy coalescing around places where rituals have happened. The cultural forms say a fascist ideology are deeply cut grooves, and if you don't click into them, you might find yourself speeding towards disaster. Genesis. In my experience, archetypes are unquestionably powerful. In the sense, I would agree to you about things being dangerous. 
We did a ritual at Stonehenge, the Ordeal X, which is basically a thalamic ritual from the Book of the Law. We got permission from English heritage to do that, letting people inside Stonehenge for the whole night on the right, astrological day and everything. Now, I didn't know the woman who was the priestess very well. These were more T.O.P.Y. people than there were traditional thalamic people, but it was a good balance. But in this ritual, there's a section where it says, unto... And the priestess is going, me. And then she goes, unto me. She went insane afterwards, quite classically insane, lost her head and had a nervous breakdown and never really recovered. What we all felt had happened was that she felt that she was goddess, not a channel or a symbol of the goddess. And I think that can happen. Instead of investigating the archetype or even allowing an archetype to manifest in ritual and ceremony, people identify with it. They think, I'm dealing with power. I am power. People have to be really honest about how they perceive themselves about their own weaknesses and traumas and temptations. In ritual, I always work with someone who is completely straight and who is there as an observer. The eye, I call them. The eye is there to police the ritual and watch everyone and make notes and also has the right to intervene. I think it's really important if you're dealing with something that you conceive of as very potent and archetypal. We are susceptible to the tiniest event in childhood or to emotional cruelty or brutality later on. These things leap back and back, come back like a hammer. To me, it should all be about being freed from those hammers, not becoming the hammer. Kenny, I also wonder about TG's camouflage clothes or armbands. Can that be flipped to the point where other people take it up and it slowly becomes what it was originally mocking? Genesis. The irony was that it didn't really happen. I decided to do psychic TV and T.O.P.Y. and make it overtly paramilitary and encourage people to wear uniforms and have the same haircuts. And interesting enough, I never saw any abuse of that. I can only assign that to the fact that the underlying philosophy was not one that would appeal to the person who would want to be that way. Kinney. So in a sense, that was playing out an impulse in a harmless fashion. Genesis. Look. T.O.P.Y. was saying it's not the uniform, it's not the armband, it's not the haircut. All the people in T.O.P.Y. were trying to look as much like each other as we can, and guess what? None of us look the same. With the best will in the world, we all end up slightly individualizing what we have. One of us just wears a different ring, and that ring shouts out as being enough to define somebody as different. It's what's going on in the mind that matters. It's not any of the trappings at all. And our mindset is definitely contrary to people wanting to sublimate other people to their will. We're not doing that, and it's not manifesting as that. We're showing you that you don't have to be afraid of the symbol. What can I say? It worked. No one I ever knew became a neo-Nazi. With T.O.P.Y., I pushed the envelope to its limit, and the message I got back was, these are good people. People who are drawn to this are being filtered effectively because they're all right. They're very supportive of each other. We couldn't have toured America without T.O.P.Y. people who'd give us their houses. They'd bring us food. They'd run the merchandise stall. They'd stick posters up. They were really positive. It was a tribe. The Cherokee weren't neo-fascist, even though they all had the same basic tribal look. There's a difference between tribalism and the mob mind. Our tribe was based on individual strength, while the mob is based on individual weakness and communal strength. Recorded in 1992, after fleeing the British government who forced Genesis and the family into exile for seven years. Genesis was never charged with anything, not even a parking ticket. But two tons of archives were seized and destroyed, and he lost both houses and all belongings, barring a strictly located archive of paper-based documentation. Thus concludes today's reading of the Psychic Bible, section 118. Tomorrow... We will begin with section 119, The Green Book, part 12.